Hello, and welcome to a bonus box of Warhammer 40K's Grim History from the Beyond. I'm Zekthar, and for the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about the Achilles Crusades. <clears throat> now, by this point in the Crusade, Lord Militant Solomon Tetrarchus has split the forces of the Imperium into three salients. These salients were designated as Canis, Akeros, and Orpheus. And since that divide, the war still continues three solar decades later, in the early decades of the 9th century of the 41st millennium. Last time we discussed the Orpheus salient, and this week we will be discussing the Akeros. A warning to those listening though, this box will be longer due to the fact that we must discuss the Hadix Anomaly. You have been warned. <laughs> now the Akeros salient is the central arm of the advancing Achilles crusade. Ever since the launch of the Three Salients by the Lord Militant Tetrarchus, it has been bogged down in blood and infamy. It has shown the least progress in terms of worlds captured, and even given the recent massive losses suffered by the Orpheus Salient, has consumed the greatest amounts of Imperial lives and war material on the pyre of battle. Assigned the majority of the Crusade's heavy line regiments, the Akira Salient was given the task of driving directly into the heart of the inhabited core of the Jericho Reach. This area was known to be plagued by warp-worshipping human renegades and xenoslavers. It was home to several petty stellar empires and dominated astrographically by the Hadex Anomaly, a warp real space distortion known to have swallowed the former sector capital within its vortex a thousand standard years previously. From the beginning, the Crusades' assault into the region that had once been the Celebo subsector of the Jericho Reach ran into trouble. Tetriarchus's plan disregarded intelligence dossiers, in part based on data provided by the Death Watch, compiled by former adjutants of Lord Militant Achilles as exaggerated and overcautious. The Lord Militant called for a dispersed assault on several fronts. He believed this plan would allow the Crusade to make steady progress and flush out serious resistance. The new Lord Militant was soon proved correct in his assessment but the scale of the resistance was far greater than anything the most pessimistic projections had warned of. The crusade was confronted by a massive, well-organized enemy counterattack. Although the crusade was expecting smaller, warp-capable raider vessels, this new foe also possessed deadly space hulks and several cruiser-class capital ships, some of which were known to be in the hands of the dread chaos space marines of the traitor legions. The Akiros Salient's Imperial Navy Fleet assets operated in a dispersal formation across more than 20 sub-battle groups. Faced with such opposition, the result was an unmitigated disaster. Dozens of naval ships were isolated and destroyed, while troop convoys with woefully inadequate escorts were hunted down and systematically ravaged. In these assaults, thousands of Imperial Guardsmen, who would not live long enough to fire a shot in the Crusade service, were slain in the cold vacuum of space. Only the bravery and skill of the Ekeros Salient's fleet's naval commanders and the resolute skill of the Space Marine contingents assigned to the Crusade forces prevented the sudden, savage losses from turning the Salient into a disorganized rout. These determined survivors organized a fighting withdrawal back to the security of the Karlak and the Iron Collar. Losses were heavy, rated afterwards at over 160,000 troops and artillery personnel in less than six weeks. The majority of these casualties were killed either inside their transport ships or cut off on the world of Kazant, itself a former crusade conquest when it was overrun by the forces of the enemy in an orgy of slaughter. In addition, more than a dozen ships of the line were either lost outright or captured by the enemy. The most grievous loss was that of the Storm Warden's chapter battle barge, War Child whose lifeless hulk was left drifting in orbit amidst the radiation-swept storm zone of the Magog binary pulsar. Since the Akeros' assailant's appalling reversal of fortune, Lord Militant Tetrarchus has resumed his assault on the region, pouring all the reinforcements he can muster into what has become a war of bloody, grinding attrition, spanning over 50 star systems and 25 Terran years of struggle. The war has focused around the control of key systems in what is now referred to as the Celebos War Zone, most notably Kazant, Vanity, and the Blood Trinity. Solid Imperial gains have been few and hard fought, with the heretic forces giving ground in some areas, but control of others remain elusive or outright impossible. 
And meanwhile, the baleful influence of whatever unnatural power resides in the Charon stars and the Hadix anomaly have become ever more apparent as time progresses. Now, before we go on with more bad news about the Salent, we must discuss these three very important worlds. And finally, the Hadix anomaly. Well, let's start with Kazant, shall we? Kazant was a death world ravaged by perpetual war long before the coming of the Achilles Crusade. What scant historical records survive the onset of the ancient Jericho sector's Age of Shadow indicate the hereditary nobility of Kazant began an irreversible slide into decadence shortly after the disappearance of Lord Sector designate Massimit Helikos in a devastating warp storm in 416.M36. Without a central imperial authority to enforce order, Kazant's noble houses were free to give in to their ambitions. Political assassinations led to blood feuds. Blood feuds led to civil war. In less than a standard century, Kazant was a planet-wide war zone. Now, Kazant's ecclesiarchy, the last weakening pillar of imperial authority, shattered under the weight of noble hubris, splitting into innumerable factions, each loyal to a different bloodline. The imperial creed was perverted to serve the needs of the nobility, each warlord claiming themselves inheritors of the god-emperor's divine authority. In a few short generations, the warlords were considered divine beings, supplanting the master of mankind as a focus for worship. By the advent of the Achilles Crusade, the god-emperor was all but forgotten upon Kazant. Millennia of war left Kazant a withered husk of a world, her mines abandoned, her fields barren, her people weak and broken. In the end, the victors were those few warlords who managed to secret away a modicum of Kazant's dwindling resources. The rest starved in their fortress keeps. Faced with the realization that Kazant could no longer support their ambitions, the remaining warlords banded together under an uneasy truce and turned their collective gaze outward. A fleet of void ships, their hulls long ago gutted to provide materials and technology for the planet's civil war, were hastily repaired. Taking advantage of Kazant's position along the Erequel main warp route, the warlords remade themselves into coursers, raiding neighboring systems and bringing new resources to their world. Now, by the time of the Achilles Crusade, Kazant was a world to be reckoned with, made wealthy by centuries of plunder, her population reinvigorated by slaves captured from across the reach, her orbital shipyards constructing powerful vessels of war. Kazant was a prize Lord Militant Tiber Achilles could not ignore. The Lord Militant claimed the world in 782.M41 after a hard-won campaign. However, as Achilles moved to consolidate imperial power in the region, the displaced warlords fled into the Charon stars to lick their wounds. Within five standard years, elements of the Kazantine warlord fleet returned, deploying the first regiments of the Stigmartus across the crusade front. Taking advantage of the Lord Militant Achilles' untimely death, this highly organized chaos cult army broke the Imperium's hold over several worlds, and so the Celebos War Zone was born. Now, at this moment, Kazant is considered the most important planet in the Celebos War Zone and is currently the most desired prize in all of the Akero Salent. It can, perhaps, even be considered the most significant strategic location in the Jericho Reach as a whole, if loss of life is any measure. For more Imperial forces have died fighting on this planet than anywhere else within the Reach. The surface of Kazant is a pocketed and pitted landscape, lined with trenches and covered with imperial crenellations and stigmatous battlements. The heaviest fighting occurs at the various landing points and staging areas. These are the strategic areas in Kazant that change hands most frequently. Often a battle will be joined as soon as a group of reinforcements arrive, with troops heading directly out of their landers to defend an already besieged spaceport from being overrun by the enemy. There is a pitched and near-constant naval engagement as well in orbit over Kazant. The inner periphery of the planet's orbit is covered with the detritus of a thousand space battles, with the still-burning remnants of cracked and broken Imperial frigates floating through the thousand-fold wreckages of old Stigmatus vessels. In this way, the fighting above Kazant is a grim reflection of what's below it with warship formations engaging in brutal and costly battles before receding to their side zone of the control. Blockade running is common and necessary, as both sides must desperately penetrate the other's area of influence to get troops to where they are most needed, the influx of which is, as often as not, 
a difference between life and death for the beleaguered combatants on the ground. When a section of the sky above is controlled by the enemy, a regiment on the surface can expect orderly bombardments and a fight against fresh troops. When it is controlled by their allies, they can expect the new reinforcements they so desperately need. Every major faction of the Imperium is present on Kazant. Numerous Imperial Guardsmen, sporting an array of regimental colors and dying by the scores. The striking Space Marines of the Adeptus Astartes, making spearheads deep into enemy lines. Ramparts and turret defenses, hastily constructed by the Magi of the Adeptus Mechanicus and their Skatari bodyguards. And the brave Sisters of Battle, fighting with ferocity and zeal. Likewise, the Allied Forces of Chaos all have a presence on this world as well. Countless Stigmatis rank and file Chaos cultists charging headlong into the last fire lines. Chaos Space Marines tearing through Austromilitarum regiments until blunted by their loyalist opposites. Disgusting, slathering mutants doing battle with shining Adeptus Sororitas. Whole waves of combat seemingly stretch from horizon line to horizon line. The rocketing explosion of artillery and orbital bombardments punctuating the fighting multitudes with tactics and formations shifting like ocean tides until each unit meets its counterpart and the occasional flare in the darkened sky, a not-so-gentle reminder that another vessel has met its fate in the void. <clears throat> now, the next planet, Vanity, has a darker story being so close to the Hadix anomaly. But going back a bit, during the ancient Jericho sector's Age of Shadow, the prideful and fractious rulers of Coral Sea were among the first to fall to the internal division and strife. Its hive cities erupted into savage civil war, which quickly escalated to the use of forbidden atomic weapons, rendering the planet into a lifeless, cinder-shrouded carcass of a world. For many centuries afterwards, Coral Seam was little more than a target for the most desperate or foolhardy of scavengers willing to brave its deadly, radioactive, fallout-strewn wastes in search of spoils. It became known more commonly by the name Vanity by those in the Jericho Reach, in reference to the hubris and folly of its former masters. With the eruption of the Hadex Anomaly, Vanity's reputation grew even darker. Engulfed for a time within the burgeoning Warp Rift, legend has it that the tortured souls of Coral Seam's billions of dead rose up screaming. Since then, Vanity has become legendary as a deadly, haunted place. These legends were proved to be lethally true, as this world became a second line in the war between the advancing Achilles Crusade and the Chaos Forces of the Stigmatis. Both have suffered at the hands of this world's spectral phenomena. The fighting on Vanity has been both sporadic and brutal, with both sides trying and failing to gain the upper hand and use the system as a base for their own operations, or at least deny it to their enemies. Owing to the extreme adverse conditions here, both sides have taken to deploying troops more likely to survive rather than more numerous fodder, unlikely to live long enough to be tactically effective. And finally, we have Blood Trinity. <sighs> now, once known as the Mataris Sisters, during the time of the Lost Jericho Sector, this system was regarded as the jewel of the Imperium. The system supported four verdant and paradise-like agri-worlds, that served as a breadbasket for the planets of the Sector's core. But with the onset of the Sector's Age of Shadows, heralded a slow descent into blasphemy for the system as, over time, they severed and abandoned human populations, embraced barbarity, and the false promises of the Dark Gods to save themselves from the brutal predations of off-world slavers and the obscene hunger of the alien. In 920.M37, Matarius IV, was subject to the final sanction of Exterminatus. This sanction was carried out by the Death Watch in order to prevent a parasite colony of the horrific Hadrius skin weaver Xenoform from spreading to neighboring worlds. As the population of Mataris systems slowly succumbed to the worship of chaos, they strove to outdo each other in savagery and slaughter. The three surviving worlds of the Mataris, known as the Blood Trinity, thrived on violence and fighting unceaselessly amongst themselves for the favor of the gods uniting only against anything foolish enough to attempt their conquest from without. The Death Watch has long suspected that the warlike natives of the Blood Trinity were chosen as a harvesting ground for fresh recruits for certain warbands of the Traitor Legions, with the most vicious among their warriors selected for their ranks. When the forces of the Achilles Crusade first probed into the Celibus war zone and stirred the servants of Chaos into response, 
The god clans and witch covens of the Blood Trinity served as a ready base of manpower for the rising powers of damnation. Some of the most vicious shock troops of the militaristic stigmatist chaos cult have been drawn from the worlds of the Blood Trinity. The heretic forces are well aware of the importance of the Blood Trinity to their cause. The system is now heavily patrolled by renegade warships, which have, so far, defeated any attempt by crusading forces to forge a beachhead into the system or conducting an effective raid. Furthermore, the infamous Carnage-class cruiser Black Grail and its attendant fleet, believed to currently be possessed of a splinter faction of the Word Bear's Traitor Legion, has been repeatedly recorded as orbiting anchorage over Martarius III, which indicates the level of opposition likely to be faced by any Imperial forces attempting to conquer the system. For the Crusading forces, this means the deployment of elite Adeptus Astartes strike teams, while the Stigmatus has formed its favored forces from twisted mutants, well suited to operate on the poisoned world, backed by witches with deadly contingents of the traitor legions to lead them. Now while all three of these sectors have been a struggle against the powers of chaos, they gain strength from the unholy Hadex anomaly. In the Celebus war zone of the Jericho Reach, there exist twin aspects of one malefic phenomenon, the Hadex anomaly. Although unclassified, it is similar to a Class III warp disturbance, an overlapping vortex of turbulence in the ether that spills over into real space, distorting and twisting its fabric, and making navigation and observation almost impossible within its baleful influence. While considerably smaller than the great and legendary warp rips, such as the dreaded Eye of Terror or the Maelstrom, it is no less dangerous. The Karen Stars, in turn, is the name of those stellar bodies trapped within the warp breach's grasp. Stars that now cast a murderous and unclean radiance wherever their light falls. Resembling a red hole in space, the Hadix anomaly rarely stays in the same place for long, having been reported in different regions of space on numerous occasions. The anomaly's mobility suggests that it might have some malign sentience. One of the theories amongst the Adeptus Mechanicus forces present as part of the Achilles Crusade is that the anomaly spews time from other dimensions into its own, distorting all attempts to monitor it more closely. The outer rim of the anomaly contains a debris-strewn ring of ghost void ships, starry-faring vessels that have become trapped in some kind of temporal stasis from which there is no release. The origin of the Hadex anomaly is shrouded in mystery, as impenetrable as the anomaly itself. What is known, with any certainty, is that the Hadex anomaly came into being during an ill-portent planetary alignment in 656.M40. The Death Watch's records state that the Vortex was the result of some great and bloody design of the mortal worshippers of chaos come to fruition on one of the lost worlds it now has swallowed a ritual unleashing the abyss of the warp into reality. Thanks to the former Jericho Sector's fall into anarchy, no throne agents were there to stop it. Apocryphal accounts link the anomaly to the blood rites practiced by the corrupted lords of Veramis, a decadent hive world thought destroyed during the anomaly's violent birth. Astrologers, though, claim that the anomaly is the result of an inauspicious planetary, or possibly galactic, alignment a confluence of forces that rip the void asunder. Darkest of all explanations are those espoused by the warp dabblers across the Jericho Reach, who claim the Hadex anomaly is only a prelude to a future calamity set to lay waste to the entire Jericho Reach. Of all the properties ascribed to the Hadex anomaly, its most perplexing feature is its visibility. When the Hadex anomaly first manifested, it was immediately visible across the Ultima Segmentum, its appearance recorded by observatories and scout stations, as distant as Nocturne, you know, the home world of the salamanders. The fact that the light cast by the anomaly was instantly visible across so vast an area, in flagrant defiance to the laws of the physical universe, has not gone unnoticed by the magi physics of the cult mechanicus. The flow of time is inconsistent within the purview of the anomaly, on a world suffused in the anomaly's glow, the length of day and night is in constant flux. Shadows cast betray hints of future events, while the voices of the past are forever at the edge of hearing. Void ships undertake brief warp jumps, emerge from the immaterium solar months after they departed or solar days before they left. 
astropathic communications is all but impossible, as fragments of messages never sent infiltrate astrotelepathic sendings. Navigators fare worst of all. The Hadix Anomaly's infectious brilliance overwhelms the light of the Astronomicon, rendering all but the most keen-eyed navigators unable to plot accurate courses along the Akero salient. Now, what little forces of the Achilles Crusade know of the Hadix Anomaly comes from the journals of Lord Captain Emmanuel Hadix, one of the few rogue traders to venture into the Jericho's Reach during the region's Age of Shadow. Born into a moderately successful dynasty operating in the vicinity of Cheridon, Emmanuel fled the realm of his birth during the invasion of the first orc arc arsonist. Seeking a new territory to exploit, Emmanuel took advantage of a break in the warp storms surrounding the lost Jericho sector to venture into the worlds beyond. When Emmanuel's flagship, the Elytris, translated from the warp, the Lord Captain was awestruck by the sight he described as like a rose suspended in firmament. In his hubris, the Lord Captain named his discovery the Hadix Nebula. Soon after the anomaly's discovery, the journal of Emmanuel Hadix begins to reflect the emerging madness of its author. Day-to-day accounts of shipboard life give way to imagined conversations between the rogue trader and the red hull bearing his name. Hadix claimed that the celestial phenomenon responded to his thoughts and somehow began communicating with him in his dreams. However, as the fleet drew closer, it became clear to Emmanuel's crew that the Hadex Nebula was something to be avoided and feared. The journals of Emmanuel Hadex and his officers record countless unnatural phenomena now commonly associated with the anomaly. Odd jumps in time, entire solar days missing from the ship's log recorder, and signals received before they had even been sent from other ships in the fleet. Still, the Lord Captain pressed on, driving his fleet ever closer to the anomaly's heart. The Lord Captain's negligence, combined with the steady erosion of morale caused by time distortions and warp phantoms, weakened the discipline and courage of the crew. When the Hypastrium, a decommissioned lunar-class cruiser under the command of one Lieutenant Argord Pym, attempted to turn back from the foolhardy journey, the Lord Captain ordered the macro batteries of his flagship turned against the fleeing vessel. The lieutenants in the command of the remainder of the Hadix fleet, torn between loyalty to the maddened Lord Captain and the desire to flee to safety, while there was still a chance, mutinied. The Navis Imperial's Eberron-class battleship Miser Ascendant discovered the derelict Elytris in 779.m41. It was found drifting on the outer edge of the vast circle of similarly adrift and abandoned vessels orbiting the anomaly. Her crew's final moment preserved in a vacuum-frozen tableau of violence. The Elytris was nevertheless intact. Lord Captain Emmanuel Hadix was found barricaded within the bridge. Seated upon his command throne, the red flicker of the Hadix anomaly reflected in his frozen eyes. Lord Militant Solomon Tetriarchus, commander of the Achilles Crusade, issued an edict setting the Hadix anomaly off-limits to all but the most highly authorized vessels which naturally included all Inquisition and Death Watch ships, and its presence is considered a celestial hazard of the utmost danger. Now, a few foolhardy souls and a rogue trader or two have tried their luck in salvaging or reclaiming some of the vessels in the temporal status ring surrounding the Hadix anomaly, but none of these expeditions has so far returned. Yet, getting back to Lord Captain Emmanuel Hadix, he actually, along with his lieutenants, left evidence of what happened to his fleet. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you what happened to Hadix's fleet, which consisted of five sturdy void ships and varying class of purpose. The fleet managed to escape the anomaly bearing their lord captain's name only to have each vessel claimed by a tragic fate. The first ship we already kind of discussed, the Hippostrum. This lunar-class cruiser was reported lost in a resurgent warp storm shortly after the mutiny that ousted Lord Captain Emmanuel Hadix. In 809.M41, a battle-scarred lunar-class cruiser of ancient design began preying upon Imperial Navy supply caravans, supporting the planetary defense forces garrisoned on the Eleusius Shrine world. While this class has yet to be conclusively identified as the Hippostrum, a degenerate crew captured in a recent boarding action over Arium, have identified their commander as the decimated Argord Pym. 
The second ship was known as the Weeping Armillus. And, okay, we have to stop here for half a second. The Weeping Armillus? What a terrible name for a ship. It just predicts doom. It's like naming a ship All Hands Dead or The Sad Mother. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyways, the Weeping Armillus was a colony ship bearing serfs, vassals, and oath-bound dredges loyal to the Hadix dynasty. This lumbering Jericho-class void ship was abandoned to a pack of Xenos raiders near the world of Credence. Surviving logs report the remainder of the Hadex fleet crippled the straining engines of the Weeping Amrillus, leaving it as easy prey for the raiders and allowing the rest of the fleet time to escape. While the fate of the Amrillus itself is unknown, it is believed that the slave cult of the Carmine Lamentation has its origins upon the unfortunate vessel. The third vessel was known as the Lilium of Corridon. The Hadex fleet lost contact with the scout frigate, as the nimble craft sought a stable route through the warp storm battering the trailing systems of the Jericho Reach. In 779.m41, a void ship bearing the Lilium of Caradon's markings drifted into the Ormassian system. Three Death Watch Battle Brothers, veterans of the Kegarin Pogrom, boarded the dialect to investigate. Yet no sooner had they boarded than the ship's warp drive surged to life, carrying the Lilium into the Imperium. The mysterious return and disappearance of the Lilium coincides with the opening of the Omega Vault, which I don't have time to get into. Regardless, the vault's leaden doors swung wide, revealing a single drop of blood hanging in a suspensor field. The blood and the gene print identifying its origin are currently under seal by the order of the Watch Commander Mordegil. Thrakenia, the fourth ship, was serving as the Hadex Dynasty's mobile mining platform, an ore smelter. It is unknown to the Masters of the Achilles Crusade what happened to it. However, a Death Watch kill team recently returned from a failed attempt to re-establish contact with the watch station Medial, reported an odd discovery upon a rogue moon adrift at the edges of the Hadex anomaly. Distributed evenly over the moon's surface, covering an area of some eight square leagues, are the components of a dismantled mining ship laid out in a meticulous order like cogs on a watchmaker's work table. More disturbing are the remains of some 15,000 crewmen arranged in nice neat rows, their organs beside them and configured like a surgeon's anatomical chart. The dead flesh shows no sign of decomposition and is moist to the touch. Finally, we have the fifth ship, Emmanuel Hadix's own Electris. Unknown to the rank and file of the Achilles Crusade, the Electris still plies the void. Commandeered by Lord Militant Achilles shortly after its discovery, the Electris was purged, refitted, and pressed into service as a blockade runner. Rechristened Dirk of Alphos to disguise her true origins, the void ship bears a dark reputation. Crewmen report hearing snatches of foul poetry carried on the stale air, and navigators claim the ship feels the pull of the anomaly. Those who serve upon the Dirk of Alphos and possess some hint as to its true origin live in fear of the day the vessel slips from the navigator's control and plunges headlong into the Hadix anomaly. Rather spooky, yes? Well, if you're going to look into the Hadix anomaly, it's only going to get worse. You see, the parsecs surrounding the Hadix anomaly are haunted by a void ship that is far more real than the stuff of Voidfair legend. It is an ill-omened ship with a cursed crew, shunned by all who detect its faint but distinct energy signature at the limits of the long-range auger sweeps. It is known as the Limitless Grasp, and it alone is the key to understanding the origins of the Hadex anomaly. The Imperial Navy first encountered the Limitless Grasp in 781.m41. Of the battle group involved, only the frigate Sebastian's Gauntlet survived the surge of warp phenomena now known to follow any manifestation of the Limitless Grasp. The aspect logs and officers' testimony regarding the incident recounts events that have played out numerous times in the history of the Achilles Crusade. This encounter and those that followed are nearly identical. An elegant merchant void ship, its hull a masterwork of lustrous silver and gleaming brass, translated from the warp into open void. After a moment of silence, the vessel's Vox channels open, broadcasting on all frequencies. The ship identifies itself as a limitless grasp, 
a free trader under the command of Chartist Captain Olympia Thytira, following immediately by a formal request to enter orbit around Veronis, a planet conspicuously absent from charts of the Jericho Reach. After another period of silence, a woman's voice requests audience with his pharaonic eminence, the sanguine Elogarch of Veronis. Again, silence followed by a burst of vox chatter as the crew of the limitless grass bear witness to a strange phenomenon consuming a planet only they can see. The engines in the limitless grass flare to life, the ship banging hard as if to escape some unrushing horror. The Hadex anomaly becomes agitated, flooding the void with red light. Distress signals and agonizing screams flood all vox channels as the limitless grasp is reduced to shreds of titanium alloy and ceramite by devastating tidal forces. Any void ship unfortunate enough to remain in the vicinity is assailed by similar gravitic phenomena. When this period of turbulence ceases, nothing remains but the void. Weeks may pass, or solar months, or standard years before the limitless grasp appears again. It is only a matter of time before her crew dies screaming at the void once more. Their deaths repeated and relived countless times. Any witness to their tragic end unlikely to survive the encounter. The wreck of the limitless grasp is but one of the many phantom void ships haunting the anomaly. Countless other vessels caught in temporal ebbs drift between past dooms and future calamities. Some claim this is the fate of all void ships that risk an engagement with the grasp. Others fear the phantom ships are casualties in an apocalyptic battle yet to be fought. None dare investigate these mysteries too closely. To do so, they warn, is to join the phantoms of the void. In the limitless grasp's final moments, the vessel's chief astropath, one Diane Quinn, transmitted a single message. This cry of awe and horror echoes throughout the warp. Those astropaths unfortunate enough to encounter this psychic missive are overwhelmed as they experience the final agonizing thoughts of their dying counterpart. An unfortunate few astropaths in service of the Achilles Crusade have perished as a result of intercepting the so-called Lamentations Wave. Some die in a moment of apoplexy as Diane's final thoughts surge through their minds. Other fall upon Psychana Mercy Blades, taking their lives rather than risk intercepting the wave again during a future manifestation of the limitless grasp. More unfortunate astropaths are driven to madness. Their minds lost to the bemoaning cry of Diane Quinn. These psychers spend the remainder of their lives sequestered in hidden compounds of the Inquisition, their incarceration broken only by periods of intense questioning. Through the interrogation of these psychers, the Inquisition hopes to gain some understanding of the true origins of the Hadex anomaly. Now, since the discovery of the Limitless Grass, the librarians of the Death Watch's watch, Fortress Eroch, have monitored the Lamentations wave, documenting each manifestation and recording whatever information can be gleaned from the minds of the unfortunate astropaths chosen to assist with the task. Designated the Lamentations Watch, the task currently falls on the shoulders of Lexicanium Eritron of the Marines' errant chapter. Known to isolate himself within his personal chapel for solar weeks at a time during bouts of ardent meditation, Lexicanum Eritron tirelessly correlates over 1,000 Terran years of psychometric data regarding the time, location, and intensity of each occurrence of the Lamentation Wave. Now, after over a solar decade of study, Eritron claims a pattern is emerging. According to a report recently filed by Watch Commander Mortigale, Lexicanum Eritron believes he has enough data to predict the exact time and place of the Limitless Grasp next appearance. Eritron now seeks a company of Battle Brothers to await the next coming of the Grasp and, if possible, board the vessel. In this way, Eritron hopes to witness the birth of the Hadix anomaly firsthand, although Watch Commander Mortigale has yet to authorize such a mission. Many doubt the wisdom of Lexicanum Eritron's plan, and several among the Death Watch doubt Eritron's sanity. It is rumored Eritron opened his mind to the Lamentation Wave in order to study the phenomenon firsthand. If so, a seed of corruption carried by the wave now roots within his mind. The Chamber of Vigilance tolerates Lexicanum Eritron's eccentricities out of respect for his service to the Death Watch. However, 
There are those within the chapter prepared to move against Eritron should rumors of his corruption prove true, preferring to deal with the matter internally, lest the Ordo Hereticus choose to investigate Death Watch affairs. Okay, so that was the spooky stuff. Yet it is not just creepy ghost ships that threaten around the Hadex anomaly. More so than any Chaos Courser, Stigmatus Battlecruiser, or Warp-Born Leviathan, the officers and voidsmen of the Akeros Salient Fleet of the Navis Imperials, fear, is the peril of Cocobiel's drop. Branching from the Eriquel Main between the Vanity and Blood Trinity systems, the drop is far more than a navigational hazard in the warp. It is a vortex leading to the churning heart of the Hadex Anomaly, and a haven for a degenerate chaos cult of rogue navigators called the Cyclopean Congregation, who have turned their sight from the blessed Astronomicon. Yet, this haven was perhaps created by the Imperium itself. You see, in 789.m41, Lord Militant Solomon Tetriarchus charged the highly decorated Commodore Bronislav Tenor Maratus with the task of charting a stable warp route between the Celebus War Zone and Semek, allowing the Achilles Crusade forces to make a direct strike against that planet of heretics, crippling the Manifactoria, an orbital shipyard supplying the Stigmatus war effort. Taking as his guide one Cocobiel Gregorius, a relatively young but gifted navigator following his house's long tradition of service to the Navis Imperialis, the Commodore set out upon his flagship, the Burden of Vigilance, an Avenger-class Grand Cruiser. Despite the best efforts of the Burden's commander, navigator, and crew, the warp beyond the Celebos war zone proved nearly impossible to chart. Warp eddies terminated into immaterial shoals. Etheric currents flowed back upon themselves, and bileless emissions of the Hadex anomaly obscured the sight of Cocobiel and his subordinate navigators. After solar months of fruitless exploration, the burden of vigilance fell prey to the Harispex, a pack of Xenos marauders believed to originate from the Sana Drift. Commodore Tenor Maratus perished in the ensuing battle, atomized during a valiant boarding action against the commander Harispex Lifeseeker. The Commodore's sacrifice routed the Xenos fleet, granting the Burden enough time to flee through the recently discovered warp passage, veering dangerously close to the Hadex anomaly. The Burden's final message, intercepted by the astropathic listening post on Pyrethus, claimed a great discovery waited at the end of the route. In the standard years following the disappearance of the Burden of Vigilance, the site of the last battle gained a sinister reputation. Void ships passing through the area drifted far off course, the sending of all but the most powerful astropaths faded into the void. A rare few vessels vanished outright. Superstitious voidsmen dubbed the region of warp space the Drop. In 793.m41, a mysterious vessel of imperial design began preying on void ships passing through the Drop. Lucia's Gauntlet, one of the few void ships to escape such an attack, identified the vessel as the Burden of Vengeance, now rechristened the Burden of Revelation and captained by none other than Cocobiel Gregorius. Quickly recognizing the threat presented by the rogue navigator, the Ecarosalent fleet of the Navis Imperialis stepped up patrols in the drop. Regrettably, this move served only to provide Cocobiel with more prey. Of the flotilla dispatched from Callist, a third fell to the burden of Revelation's guns. A half-dozen vanished beyond the drop in a futile search for Cocobiel's sanctuary. Of the remaining vessels, only three were accounted for, arriving at Kazant over a decade later after limping through the warp without navigators. Gregorius now claims the drop in all space beyond as his domain, requiring tribute from those passing through. Void ships unfortunate enough to run afoul of the burden of revelation must pay the toll or face reprisal. The exact nature of these tolls depends on Cocobale's whims and the needs of his vessel. Now, fuel, provisions, and crew are the most common price for safe passage. On other occasions, Cogabiel's demands a teraton of bilge water, spent macro cannon shells, or some other void ship byproduct of little apparent use. Lord captains who refuse to pay the tariff face Cogabiel's vengeance. Most are fired upon outright, their void ships raided by the mad acolytes of the Cyclopean Congregation. Warships capable of defending against hit-and-run attacks are stocked for days, 
hounded by the burden of revelation, as it flits into and out of the warp just long enough to unleash a volley of lance fire. A lamentable few are given the illusion of escape, left untouched by a seemingly resigned Cogobiel. These vessels soon find themselves off course, lost in the drop, and drifting ever closer to the core of the Hadex anomaly. By special order of Lord Militant Solomon Tetriarchus, all commanders of the Akira Salient Fleet of the Navis Imperialis are prohibited from acquiescing to Cogobiel's demands. Those who fail to abide by these orders face a traitor's execution. Naval commanders are left with a difficult choice then. Brave Cocobales drop and risk an encounter with the master of the Cyclopean congregation, or bypass the drop entirely and add solar weeks to the length of the voyage. Now, to give you a little background on this vagabond, Cocobale is a scion of the House of Gregorius, a navigator bloodline whose service in the Navis Imperialis stretches back to the Age of Apostasy. Though his household is renowned for producing navigators of distinction, Cogobiel's brief commission is shamefully unremarkable. The discovery of the drop marked the end of Cogobiel's obscurity, as well as his loyalty to the crusade. Once considered handsome by navigator standards, Cogobiel's few pleasing features are lost in pallid skin, elongated bones, and a perpetual grin, both sardonic and beatific. However, Cocobiel's most striking features are his eyes, or lack thereof. At the moment of his first revelation, Cocobiel plucked out his eyes, sacrificing mundane sight for the visions imparted in the Hadix anomaly. Now, only his third eye remains. Cocobiel's warp eye is forever open, shedding a purulent red glow that casts no shadow. This eye is a thing of cosmic terror. Some claim it as a window into the anomaly. Others claim it contains a fragment of the anomaly itself. Still, others speculate that Cocobiel's blighted eye is a microcosm, a fleshy orb containing the Hadix anomaly in miniature. The truth is known only to Cocobiel and his most trusted followers. Strangely, though Cocobiel is familiar with the Jericho Ma warp gate, having passed through it with the majority of his household at the onset of the Achilles Crusade, he is content to keep the gate's secret to himself. Whether Cocobiel holds his tongue out of some remaining vestige of honor, or plans to use his knowledge as a bargaining chip in the future remains to be seen. A self-proclaimed prophet, Cocobiel Gregoris, presides over a mysterious cult of degenerate navigators and decadent voidsmen known as the Cyclopean Congregation. Named for Cocobiel and his inner circle of renegade navigators, all of whom are blind save for their third eye, the congregation cult promises illumination through communion with the Hadix anomaly. Practicing complex rites of initiation, the cult's upper echelons are only open to full-blooded navigators. Only those with the warp eye, preaches Cocobale, can appreciate the anomaly for what it truly is. According to his own blasphemous lore, Cocobale's drop is more than a convoluted region of the Immaterium. It is an entrance to a stable warp route spiraling into the heart of the Hadix Anomaly, a place where the meaning of space and time are inverted. The fallen navigator leads his Cyclopean congregation on blasphemous pilgrimages along this route, each journey a profane recreation of the burden of vigilance first passage through the Anomaly. During these voyages, acolytes ritually blind themselves, sacrificing an eye for each level of initiation attained within the cult. The lowest tiers of the congregation are collections of outcast voidsmen. Largely ignorant of the true nature of the cult, many of these void-born fanatics lost their humanity to madness and mutation long before pledging fealty to Cocobiel. Wandering corridors and groping along bulkheads, the most devoted acolytes eagerly trade their sight for deeper initiation. Most revered outside Cocobiel's inner circle are the Typhlotics, bearers of the dormant navigator gene. Culled from renegade houses and the extended families of raided navigator households, these priests of the congregation command the voidsmen flock and act as intermediaries between the cult's inner and outer circles. Having sacrificed both eyes already, Typhlotics go a step further, carving jagged spirals into their foreheads, symbolizing both the coiling route of Cocobiel's drop and the swirling energies contained in their prophet's third eye. 
These scars mark the high priests of the Cyclopean congregation. The inner circle of the Cyclopean congregation consists exclusively of navigators personally initiated by Cocobiel at the nucleus of the Hadix anomaly. The congregation's oracles and herophants, these prodigal scions of the Navis nobility, are the unquestioned masters of the cult. Spending most of their time in quiet contemplation, these Cyclopean oracles speak only to disseminate prophecy and issue orders to the Typhlotic clergy. The Cyclopean oracles possess the greatest secret of the congregation. Using the Hadix anomaly as a guide in place of the Astronomicon, they navigate the congregational fleet safely and nearly instantaneously across the Jericho Reach. Cocobiel foretells a coming age of chaos and despair, a time when the Astronomicon will fail, leaving the Navis nobility scrambling in the abyssal dark. The nobility's only salvation, Cocobiel preaches, comes in the form of the Hadix anomaly, a new and vital light in the warp. Those who comprehend the mysteries of the anomaly and use its light to guide their passage through the warp will be masters of the coming age. Cocobiel envisions a time when the influence of the anomaly encompasses the galaxy entire, every segmentum awash in its bloody glow. Now, not every navigator brought before Cocobiel Gregoris is a willing convert. Navigators abducted in raids, captured in boarding actions, or traded to the Cyclopean congregation by desperate crew are loath to risk damnation at the foot of a self-proclaimed prophet. Those who reject Cocobiel's offer of enlightenment and initiation into the congregation suffer fate few planet-bound humans understand. With a savage twist of his talon-like fingers, Cocobiel rins the apostate's third eye, plucking the sensitive organ from the victim's forehead. Deprived of the warp site and rendered useless in the eyes of the Navis nobility, Cocobiel turns this unfortunate free. Some are dropped in imperial territory, mutilated reminders of Cocobiel's private crusade. Others are ransomed back to their households. The worst of these wander bilge decks of the burden of revelation, their pitiful cries reverberating throughout the ancient bulkheads. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting tired of talking about this navigator. If I was allowed to wreak havoc in this universe, this guy would be probably at the top of my list. He's kind of up there with Lucius and, and Fabius. But when, mind you, I wouldn't kill it. I'd just rip out his third eye and stuff him in his spacesuit and then shoot him out into the void. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, but, <clears throat> anyways, I am sorry, folks. I, I, I just can't do that. And more than that, I got one more thing I have to discuss about this lech, his fleet. Now, unknown to the masters of the Achilles Crusade, Cocobiel Gregoris commands a growing fleet of void ships. Dubbed the Congregational Fleet, this flotilla of ramshackle spacecraft is composed of ships lost to the anomaly over the past millennium. Patiently gathering and retrofitting the Cyclopean Congregation, the fleet is currently moored among the remains of a shattered moon. Repaired with archaeotechnology, cannibalized from derelicts, considered beyond all hope of redemption, these ships are preparing for war. <clears throat> well, now you know of the Hiddick's anomaly and all the horror that it entails. Perhaps we, we get back to happier times. Like, how bad the Akira Salad is doing, huh? <laughs> <clears throat> Despite the difficulties of the Hadex anomaly and the Celebos war zone, the Ekero assailant was at last beginning to show slow signs of progress, with fresh Imperial reinforcements channeling in from the Calexis sector and stripped from the other Crusade assailants, adding to its power. However, all this ended thanks to the recent disaster we discussed last time with the Orpheus assailant and the coming of the Tyranid menace. This has led to re-entrenchment in the face of a possible onslaught on a second front and could cause the collapse of the entire Orpheus arm, threatening the very existence of the Achilles Crusade. In these last years of tribulation, the character of Solomon Tetriarchus himself has changed, and while he remains a charismatic leader, he has become subject to paranoia about traitors in the ranks. A paranoia perhaps well justified, given the nature of the enemies he faces, but a very dangerous behavior for a man with a Lord Militant's unbridled authority. The battles against the Tal and the Tyranid and the Canis assailant 
which we will be talking about next time, produced plenty of refugees and deserters from the Austro-Militarum and the Imperial Navy. There are no punishments for desertion in the Imperial military other than death. So such deserters are keen to find somewhere to hide from Imperial authorities, or even somewhere that would welcome such desperate yet capable men. Many deserters choose to follow the rumors of the deserter's coil, a region of the Canis Salient hemmed in by nebula and gravity wells, and one which Imperial forces are too thinly stretched to control. There, it is said, colonies of free-minded men and women can live demanding but ultimately free lives among untouched alien worlds. Rumors claim that these worlds have been abandoned, leaving whole cities untouched save for their lack of inhabitants. Riches lie undisturbed, and a new life waits for anyone who can make it to these flawed but free planets. Some renegades in the Imperial Navy can offer safe passage along the hidden routes to the coil, as long as they are handsomely paid. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, hang on a minute, I thought you said we would be talking about the Cane Assailant next time. I am, and, and trust me, this has the Akira Salient written all over it. We, we just gotta get there. <laughs> all of these rumors, however, are lies. The truth is infinitely more malevolent. The deserter's coil is real, but it is ruled by emissaries of the Dark Gods from the Celebos War Zone, who have set up their petty kingdoms among these benighted planets. These chaos cult leaders hope to appease their masters by forging insane armies from those lured to the deserter's coil, then launching attacks on the Cane Assailant to further divert Imperial forces from the Celebos war zone. The worlds and settlements in the deserter's coil are places of cruelty and nightmare, ruled over by petty tyrants who grow closer to true champions of chaos with every passing day. <clears throat> And now, you know the suckage that is the Akira Salient. <clears throat> Join us next time when we discuss the Cane Salient, which is at least going better than what is taking place in the Akira's plight, as well as the Tyranid-infested Orpheus Salient, but just barely. Now, if you enjoyed this box, feel free to like, comment, follow, and of course, subscribe. Have a great day, and as always, <clears throat> until next time. This is Ekthar, signing off.